Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Aaron's High Cap Adventure Radio Program. I'm Matt Beatrice, your host. And for those of you who don't have access to video, we will have this show up, some parts of this show up, on the KTEM channel, YouTube channel. You can check that out. It will be posted on my website as well, aaronsgunshop.com. And with us now on the screen is my special guest, Cameron Police Chief James R. Randy Dixon. Chief, it is a pleasure to have you here. I appreciate you letting me come on this morning. Thank you for coming on. What I'd like to do for the audience, though, is give them a quick read of who you are, who I'm talking to, because you've got a nice little history here. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, Chief Dixon here was born in Temple, Texas in 1954, so he's one of us. His employment, I think, is impressive. I want to read to you some parts of it. He's with the Temple Police Department from 73 to 97. And he dealt with Sergeant of Training for D.A.R.E. program, drug abuse resistance education, crime prevention. He do, he's done traffic and patrol, communications. So he's pretty much done the gamut when it comes to that department. From there, 1999 to 2011, City of Morgan Points Resort Pol- Chief of Police, also the Assistant City Manager. So he's working two hats there. Then University of Phoenix, lead faculty chair, criminal justice, Austin campus, campus facility, or faculty assessment liaison, and is now currently with the city of Cameron, chief of police from 2011 until current. I'd like to tell you some of his certifications, too. He's a master police officer license. He has a master's police officer's license, instructor's and advanced instructor's license, certified crime prevention specialist, DARE instructor's license, security consultant license, Texas Department of Public Safety and Professional Security Board. And this is very interesting. Awards and honors. I'm pretty impressed here. Recognized three times as Police Officer of the Year. 84 Departmental Commendations, Temple Police Department. 21 Award of Merit from Private and Civic Organizations. 1994 United States Police Officer of the Year, Law Enforcement Institute of Washington, D.C. And 1994 Presidential Commendation Award, Peace Officer of the Year, the White House, Washington, D.C. So, Chief Dixon, you got a nice little resume there. you got a lot of information. That's why I wanted you on the show. You're a man with a plan who can talk and uh, give it to us straight. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come on with me. I, I've spent 42 years in this business. And over those times, you've learned a lot, and you've seen the mistakes of the past, and you try to improve yourself and improve your your department and your craft. And that's one of the interesting things we can do. That's fantastic. And let me tell you, I know a lot of people in my audience and how they think. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Dixon here does not have a SWAT team mentality, and I don't take that away from a SWAT team individual. What I'm saying is he looks at it a situation and looks at all the aspects of it and just doesn't react like we had discussed. I'm very impressed with how he does that. With all my guests, I always send them a set of questions that I have because this is not we're not putting anybody in a hot seat. I want to send out the questions so that the guests can read them, understand it, and come up with an answer that is thorough so you, the audience, can uh, feel better, more comfortable, or understand better some topics that we're talking about. So, Chief, if you don't mind, we're going to hit it hard, okay? Absolutely. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to call up and ask a question, now's the time to write your questions down and call up, get in line. The number is 254-773-1400. Okay, Chief, this one is a big one with me, and we kind of discussed it before the show. There has been a wall built between law enforcement and the citizenry that has grown tall and thick, a wall that causes division, anxiety, and at times, aggression towards each other. What, in your opinion, has caused that wall, and what, in your opinion, can knock down that wall? Chief. One of the, uh, the things that I believe has caused that more than anything has been the advent of instantaneous media. Uh, back in the, in the years of the 80s, 70s, 80s, you heard and you saw what happened uh, around the world, but it wasn't as it was happening. Uh, we have the different news medias, the, the uh, national news medias that put a certain slant to it. And I think that, is, that hasn't caused it, but it hasn't helped the issue as well. One of the other things that I believe that we have done in this country is we have, we have forgotten what the community policing standards are. Uh, citizens expect to be treated a certain way, and when you don't treat them in the fashion of uh, compassion first, then respect, what you do is you lose some of the support that you've, you've historically had. Uh, I don't care where you're at, people and citizens are going to be the same. You have to treat them with the respect. Once you treat that respect, you start eroding that wall that has been built. 
Uh, I hope that wall can come down uh, much like the Berlin Wall did back in the 80s. But we have to try hard, and we have to try harder to have the citizens understand that we're going to do basically the laws that are on the books. And when the laws are on the books, there's a couple of ways you can look at that. You know, there's not a single one of us in humanity that hasn't violated some law. That's right. It just hasn't happened. And we have the letter of the law and the uh, the gray of the law, black and white. I like to think that a police officer has common sense. We've got to get that common sense back, not only for the police officers, but for the citizens as well. And once we meet halfway, I believe that wall is going to crumble. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard him say common sense. For those of you who know me, you know I teach that in my class. I teach respect and I teach common sense. I mean, don't be stupid out there and always show respect. It goes, it's a two-way street. So as Chief's here talking about his officers or any officer should be showing respect, we need to do it likewise. We just need to start getting that back. And the other thing too, Chief, cell phones, I will not tell somebody they can't film. Uh, that They can have every right to film it. But I was just adding on to what you are saying. It's so instantaneous. It can cause a little stir. Absolutely. You know, in the cell phones, it's fine that you record a person or a police officer doing their job. But if you're going to record it, record the whole thing. Let the whole thing go through, not just a segment of it that makes one or the other look bad. And I I don't have a problem with cell phone recordings. Just likewise, I don't have a problem with police officers on the recordings as well. Yeah, understood. Goes both ways. All right, Chief, that that was a great answer. Let's move on to number two. What are your thoughts? This is a big one for me, too. Right. What are your thoughts on organizing and developing a police posse, a group of people, CHLs in particular, to ride along or assist officers so they will have immediate backup if necessary? And I don't mean a posse where you're doing cemetery duty, putting flags down. I'm talking, hey, we got an element in society now, the way the world's getting. You guys need backup. We want to be on the front. We want to do something. What can we do? If you'd asked me that question several years ago, I would have said absolutely not. Uh, there's too much risk the officer might look towards uh, trying to uh, pay more attention to his rider than he would the citizen or the bad guy he's dealing with. But times have changed. Officers need protection and people need protection. I don't know if our Texas Commission or law enforcement would ever allow that or if the insurance companies that cover the riders of the city would al- allow it. But if you've got somebody that's trained in CHL and you have you have learned about them personally, what their background is, what their reactions are, what you'd do through some kind of a filtering process. I really don't see a major problem with that. Help me clarify something. So in other words, um, from my understanding, a a sheriff could get a posse up, no problem. Um, So you're saying a a police chief, a city, has more problems getting that done? I believe they would because the sheriff is countywide. And I I haven't, uh, you know, I I know back in in the western days of the 1800s that they used posses. Today, most of the sheriff's posses are more ceremonial than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't even know if they're armed. I, I really can't answer that question. But I do know that uh, if if we as a police officer are out here and we need help and we solicit and we ask for help, um, we would hope our citizens would back us up. I, I believe in the CHL program. I actually believe in what our governor has just done as far as open carry yes. for those that are qualified. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's funny you should mention that because I had a question that was asked to me this morning by a person very cl- uh, close to me. And she asked me, she said, okay, I'm going into a, a store to buy something. I'm CHL and I've got my pistol. And I see somebody robbing the store. Do I have the right to pull my pistol and defend that person or to save that person? And I, at that point, I really didn't have a good answer for it. But then I started thinking, you know, we're a humanity. And if we can't protect each other in humanity, we have a serious, serious problem. Uh, It takes a, uh, we always have taught it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I think it takes a nation to keep to keep the nation together, not just one individual. So I, uh, I wouldn't have an issue with that. That, Oh, I agree. Absolutely. They have the right to do that. My, my only concern with blanket statements is because i tr- do all this training and it's like you do you can't just give somebody yes go ahead and defend they're all there comes the factors of wh- why can't you just let the person go because once the threat is over it's over i, I want to get people out of the thought process process of immediately thinking they have to engage with a firearm exactly. that's where communication comes in body language so on and so forth okay that's that could be a whole another hour sure section um the other thing one last thing on the on the posse part of it the chl's 
I mean, for, for me, for example, I do advanced training and I teach a whole bunch of people advanced training. I mean, I, I have a whole uh, list of people I could say, hey, these guys are advanced in their training. They could help you out a lot. And the other, one last comment on that, too, is I, I know a handful of the law enforcement in my area, okay, and they know me. If they got my number and I'm around and they need help, I'll be there. You know, just give me a call. All right. Number three. This one's interesting. Although officers will back each other up, in my opinion, there is no unified, and this is a nice question, this is not an aggressive question, okay? Uh, there is no unified thought process when it comes to the protection of the people in times of natural and man-made disasters. Let me clarify. What assurances do the people have that not only will they be protected, but their rights under the Constitution will be too? Let me clarify one more time. What I'm trying to get at is this. We have calamity. And the officers are going to back each other up. That's the way you do it when you're in uniform. I was in the military. You back the guy up in the foxhole, okay? But when the community is, is bad, something's going on calamity-wise, how can they feel safe, not only that you're supposed to be there, supposedly, but that they're not going to be trampled on from their constitutional rights of being able to keep their weapons in case something happens? Right. You know, I, I thought about this question in depth the uh, last few days, and I do know that, for instance, with, with our agency and the agencies that are around us, including the Bell County agencies, we practice for major events. We have, uh, I know in Cameron and Milam County, and I, as well as Bell County, they have at least two major, major uh, incidences where they, they foresee something happening bad, mm-hmm. and they practice on how they're going to deal with it. I don't believe in my truth and honesty that any law enforcement officer is going to care about anything at that point except search and rescue and keeping people safe. Um, as, as far as their rights are concerned, I believe we'd be more apt to go the opposite way and let people have more leeway than we would when uh, maybe it was, a, it was a right situation or something. Um, you know, your training. It's all about training. Yes, sir. And at that point, you go into rescue. If you have a calamity, say an earthquake or a tornado or a major explosion such happened in West, your first and foremost thoughts are for rescue and to helping people. And um, you have to keep certain people out of the area, those that are coming in just to onlook. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those rights, they have no right to come in and to interfere with the people that are trying to help somebody. Uh, you have no right to come in and try to be, I hate to use the word gawkers, but gawkers, just for the sake of taking a picture or something. So I don't, uh, I honestly don't believe any of this law enforcement or any law enforcement in this region of Texas uh, would ever, ever forsake someone's rights during a calamity. Um, I was, you saw me shuffling through the book. I was trying to find the law. Uh, Perry signed after Katrina. I can't remember the number on it. But it basic, what it basically said was because what happened in Katrina and people's guns were being taken away, even when they were in high and dry spots, we, we put this law in effect that in, if there's time of an emergency, if an officer comes by and says, hey, let me have the gun for a minute, okay, it's not for a, um, a crimes being done or they don't need it for whatever situation is going on, they give it back to the individual before they leave. I got no problems with that right. as long as it's insured, okay, yep. that, that that's going to happen. I uh I wouldn't foresee, honestly, I wouldn't foresee us taking guns away. Now they, that We didn't go through Katrina or Ike here in our area, but uh, I can't foresee any officers taking a gun away unless it's being pointed at them. Well, this is Texas. They may not be able to take it away. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, Chief, we're running, time's ticking, so let me move on a little bit here. Um, Chief, for years, as far back as I can remember, on the side of police cars were written the words to serve and protect. Those words are no longer there, and I wanted to show you a picture that I cut out. Ladies and gentlemen, I cut out... Uh, a picture from the newspaper and it's basically showing a sheriff's vehicle with the words in God we trust on it and people were throwing a fit about it and um, so my question was those words are no longer there do you have any idea why and if so can you share with the audience why to serve and protect is not there I know that uh, honestly I haven't been in a department that had that on the side of their car in my 42 years Uh, no we had different we had different slogans or different mottos uh, for instance, our motto down at Cameron is courtesy, professionalism, and respect. That's our department motto. Uh, when I was chief at Morgan's Point, we had that actually on our cars. I believe and truly believe the only reason you don't see that on so many cars anymore is because everybody's gotten cute with graphics. <laughs> is that right? They've gotten cute with graphics, and they're trying to put all these different fancy uh, signs on the side of their car. Uh, and that is kind of... That has kind of been left aside, just like, you know, you see 911 on the side of the car. You know, Chief, that, that's something, though. No, you just brought up something. They're so into the graphics and how they look, 
it's like, what are you in, what are you in uniform for? What's the deal, man? Think about it. Where's your mindset when you're doing all this? How, don't you get an idea of how the public's perceiving that? I, I do, and um, I can't answer that. I wish I could answer that. It's just uh, the signs of the times more than anything else. I know that, and everybody jokes about it, but when I started policing, and, and many, many years ago, for most people who were even born, that, talk, that works for me now. I had, in my first police car, a sign on the side of the car <laughs> with a number and a, a red light in the top. Wow. But, and no computers, no handheld radios. And we all lived pretty good. We all lived we? pretty good. Unfortunately, we've changed a lot since then. And society has modernized, and they modernized the department. The graphics on the car is... Um, that is a, a basically they judge your your department many times by what you what your cars look like. I think that's unfair. Now to say that I have pretty good nice graphics on our police cars and cameras as well. <laughs> At least you're honest. Uh, you. <laughs> I'm honest. You know we we put nice graphics on our cars because we want to be seen. Um, well, that's different. You know, that's a different attitude. Different we want attitude. to be seen. Okay, chief. And let's let's move on because we're out of time. Okay. Um, this one I think a lot of people relate to. It seems a lot of the times that everybody knows where the drugs are in their town and where they're coming from and who's dealing them. Why does it take so long then for them to be arrested if the citizens say, hey, he's right there, I saw it, and here's a backup witness too? Boom. If you can get the witness who will be willing to go to court and testify and they can say that they saw that person, it shouldn't take long. But However, but will the but will the bad guy come out in two days and they want to beat that guy up? That's the problem. So what we have to do when we get information, for instance, on on drugs, and we do this all the time, we get information where drugs are being sold or, or peddled. We have to have someone do controlled buys for us. I mean, that's the reality of law enforcement. Uh, you just can't. You have to protect that person's Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, even though they're selling drugs, they have the Fourth right, Fourth Amendment right protections. So we have to build a case. And it takes months, sometimes even, uh, I know one case that has gone on for years to try to build, especially when you're looking at someone larger, someone big. Mm-hmm. Um, the street the street dealer, we you can pop those in all day long. But if you're trying to build a, a case that gets a dramatic amount of drugs, it's going to take a while. It's going to take uh, an investigation, just like any other investigation. I wish it was quicker. I do, because... Uh, it's frustrating for the citizens to say, we know that that house, we know that person in that house is selling drugs. Uh, we just can't go bust through the door and take the drugs. The, the Fourth Amendment will allow us to do that. And I am big on protecting people's rights. Absolutely. I will sacrifice a little bit of safety to maintain my freedom. I'm not giving up my freedom. Too many have fought for it and died for it.